Another, of course, of Kurzweil's claims is that he suggests that advancements, advancements in biotech and AI will eventually lead to the possibility of humans achieving immortality through medical advancements and digital consciousness. And this, of course, has been called transhumanism. What do you think about this? So I guess quoting from the book, I think this is hooey. I mean, it's a total misunderstanding of the nature of intelligence, uh, a desperate one. So one of the points the book makes is that you can't rank intelligences. So, and to think about that, let's think about vehicles. So I talk about top trumps in the book. So when I was a kid, I used to love playing top trumps. This game where you have cards and, and each card has some set of indicators about how fast a car is or how many cylinders its engine has. And the idea is, you know, if you've got the Ferrari F40, then I say, oh, Joe, top speed, 196 miles per hour or whatever. You, you go, damn it. I've got the Triumph TR7, top speed, 45 miles per hour. And you're like, and I win your car. But the game's pretty uninteresting if there's one card that beats all other cards. And so they put in things like carrying capacity. So carrying capacity, Ferrari F40, you know, not even a golf bag. Um, carrying capacity, Ford Transit, you know, one ton. And of course, in that case, the Transit beats the F40. Because cars are multifaceted, vehicles are multifaceted. The right vehicle for traveling to New York is different from the right vehicle uh, for traveling f um, from Cambridge to London. And it's also dependent on what are you carrying? You're just carrying a message or are you carrying tiles or what's your objective? And cars are multifaceted like that. Vehicles are multifaceted like that. Intelligence is multifaceted like that. So different intelligences have different natures. And one of the challenges we face is that people in the past have tried to project intelligence onto what one would say is a unidimensional nature. So IQ is a measure of that. And IQ emerges from the era of eugenics. So the term general intelligence itself is an attempt to flatten our intelligence and turn it into something that we can rank, like height. So we can rank height. And the notion was, and this is coming from Francis Galton back in the sort of 19th century, that if we could rank height, then we can rank intelligence and then we can breed a better intelligence. So this term general intelligence comes from Spearman around that time, and it's specifically associated with this eugenic movement. So when you, one talks about artificial general intelligence, we're dipping back into that way of thinking. Now, that way of thinking didn't just have moral problems. It had basic scientific flaws that intelligence is multifaceted like cars are multifaceted. So different people are good at different things. It's one of the great pleasures of working together. Now, in a very different sense, when it comes to this notion of atomism that I talk about, when it comes to the thing that is unique to humans, what I say that is, is not our capabilities, but our limitations and our vulnerabilities. So the computer can't have those because it doesn't have them. And the primary limitation I talk about is something that we can measure like height and that's communication bandwidth. So machines can communicate because they communicate with speed of light. They communicate a million times faster than I can communicate with speed of sound right now. And this has been true for ages. So when people are talking about artificial intelligence singularities and computers with orders of magnitude more intelligence than us, you can't measure that, but you can measure these information transfer rates and they are already orders of magnitude ahead. You know, six orders of magnitude by the physics. And then when you look at the implementation, it becomes more like seven or eight or eight and a half orders of magnitude faster in terms of communication. And this is the principal difference between our decision-making and the machines is the machine is working with eight orders of magnitude more information. And once you have an entity that's doing that, the nature of its intelligence turns out, well, where it uses its intelligence, its nature of its decision-making, intelligence is a difficult word, the nature of its decision-making based on information turns out to be quite, quite different. But because our bandwidth is limited, so that here's, here's the sort of cutting to the chase, the problem is, one of the ways that we communicate 
and overcome our limited bandwidth, one of the marvels about us is we anthropomorphize. Now I have difficulty saying that. So in the book, I just say anthrox, where X equals pomorphize. So we anthrox things all the time. So in order to communicate with you, with your listeners, you know, I'm trying to think about ideas that will resonate with the listener that will capture some essence of what I'm trying to say, but they are actually relating to their experiences or the experiences of our cultures or the wider world. So when we are trying to communicate with an intelligent entity, we tend to think of it as human and we think of it as human because that helps us to communicate it. And therein lies the problem. When people are thinking about these computers that are nothing to do with humans processing information eight orders of magnitude faster than us, they tend to anthrox them, to anthropomorphize them. And part of when we project our own intelligence onto others is we kind of assume those intelligence will have the same motivations of us. So you can sort of see weirdly reflected in this very distorted way, some idea of what those people would do if they had that amount of information when they talk about the result, because they tend to think of themselves as intelligent. They tend to think of themselves as as the ultimate human being, because we all sort of have this tendency, these biases to think of ourselves as, as good when they sort of say, well, if the computer is that much better than me in all these things I used to take pride in, then surely it would do all these things I would want to do. No, no, it's, it's nothing to do with you. I mean, just as the plants around you, which is another form of information processing, don't have your motives, um, machines don't have your motives and they don't have your way of processing information. That's not to say it isn't an enormous issue that we have machines that have eight orders of magnitude, more information acquisition than we do. It is. And that's the issue we need to address. And unfortunately, the way the conversation is going at the moment into this sort of simplistic killer robots direction is undermining our ability to address the real problems that are affecting people today.